And now it is indeed my pleasure to welcome my mentor, one who is true to our God and to our native land, our spiritual leader who is taking us in a, on an ever-expanded journey of, exp of expression, an ever-expanding unfoldment of this temple of light. And you will hear more about that as time goes on. Our spiritual leader, the beloved Reverend John Scott. Wow, that's some introduction. Thank you, Vance, and good morning, worldwide spiritual family. Joy to add my own words of welcome to the Temple of Light Center for Spiritual Living, as I always say, in beautiful Jamaica. And that song, Lift Every Voice and Sing, just opens my heart. You know, it, it just makes me so aware of how far we have come. And so I wanted to speak a little bit about that path that we have walked and for the hope and the beauty and the joy that people of color, of color have always brought to the human experience. Just a little bit of history. In the year 730 BCE, before the Common Era, Paye, the king of Cush, decided that the only way to save Egypt from itself was to invade and conquer it. According to the National Geographic magazine, who in 2008 had an article on the, the history of the Nubians to mark Black History Month, this pyre did. He conquered Egypt, thus becoming the first of a series of Nubian kings who ruled over all Egypt as the country's 25th dynasty. Through inscriptions on stelae by both Nubians and their enemies, it is possible to map out those rulers' vast footsteps through the sands of time. The black pharaohs reunited a tattered Egypt which had been torn apart by petty warlords warring among themselves, and they filled its landscape with glorious monuments, creating an empire that stretched from the southern border at present-day Khartoum all the way north to the Mediterranean Sea. They stood up to the bloody and bloodthirsty Assyrians and perhaps saved Jerusalem in the process. According to National Geographic magazine, the ancient world, and listen to this, was devoid of racism. I quote, at the time of Paye's historic conquest, the fact that his skin was dark was irrelevant. Artwork from ancient Egypt, Greece, and Rome shows a clear awareness of racial features and skin tone but there is little evidence that darker skin was seen as a sign of inferiority. Only after the European powers colonized Africa in the 19th century did Western scholars pay attention to the color of the Nubian skin to uncharitable effect. End of that quote. It is remarkable, my friends, that there was a that there has been a chapter of history that largely went untold. And that, as the Geographic magazine puts it, and I quote, only in the past four decades have archaeologists resurrected their story and come to recognize that the black pharaohs didn't appear out of nowhere. They sprung from a robust African civilization that had flourished on the southern banks of the Nile for 2,500 years, going back as far as the first Egyptian dynasty. Talk about black history. Black History Month 
always brings back a memory from my early childhood. You see, I attended what in those days was called an elementary school here in Kingston. I think they're called primary schools now. I attended Providence Elementary School, where for the most part, my classmates came from lower income families. And then I was going to go to high school. So the night before my first day at one of Jamaica's prestigious high schools, my father, who we called Big John, whose marriage to my mother, Daisy, had been vigorously opposed by her mother, because he was, of course, too dark. Um, he stood me before the mirror and asked, what do you see, son? I see me, of course, was my saucy answer. But who is the me that you see, he persisted. I was, as usual, anxious to go do whatever in the, you know, with my friends across the, across in the neighborhood. And so I silently hoped that this wasn't going to be one of those lengthy philosophical meanderings with heavy sprinklings of poetry, which he was wont to, to put my brother Dennis and myself through. And so rolling my eyes heavenwards, I said, oh, come on, Dad, you tell me. As if reading my thoughts, Daddy said, no, this is not going to be a lecture, Jay. However, tomorrow is your first day at Jamaica College, where you will meet and make friends with many boys of many different nationalities, and some of them are from very wealthy families. So I want you to remember who you are, where you come from, and what your heritage is. Oh God, I thought I have the weirdest parents. This is so embarrassing. Anyway, I just buckled my lip and said, you know, I'll get through this. And then he proceeded to tell me that, you know, the heritage is so rich that our ancestors built the pyramids and made the world's first university. I thought, yeah, right, good. And, you know, your point is kind of thing. But, you know, friends... I wasn't at my new prestigious school more than a week before some of my cohorts began boasting about their family trees and whose father was the chairman of which corporation. One of my newfound friends even wore a ring with his family coat of arms. Me to think is only, is only nations and countries have coat of arms. Well, his family had a coat of arms which he wore. But as impressed as I was, I also had a sense of myself being valid and valuable. So much so that when the son of a prominent Jewish family boasted truthfully about the synagogue here in Kingston being the oldest in this hemisphere and said that his ancestors, ancestors who came from Portuguese, or there were Portuguese Jews, I think, fleeing uh, persecution, and he said they helped to build the synagogue, I just could you know, have a little smug look on my face and say, that's nothing. My ancestors built the pyramids and had the world's first university and indeed the, fir the world's first library. So if you think you're bad, sit there. Yeah. I really just had that strong sense of self. Listen to this paragraph from the geographic article. I quote, today Sudan's pyramids, greater in number than all of Egypt's, are haunting spectacles in the Nubian desert. It is possible to wander among them unharassed, even alone, a world away from Sudan's genocide or the aftermath of civil war. You know, my friends, I really believe it is pointless to agonize about how and when we as a people, people of color, lost our sense of identity and began to believe and then demonstrate the lie that we are somehow inferior or that any race or category of person is better than, less than, or more than another. In similar vein, it serves no purpose to try and figure out when the human race began to embrace the idea of duality. Suffice to say that countless people of every race and creed and culture have subscribed to this erroneous premise 
And as we know, genocide and systemic racism has been the result. When did we get there? You know, how did we come from building pyramids and um, a civilization that, that was the top, the pinnacle of world and human endeavor to being made to feel less than and inferior? When did we, have to, when did we learn to start bleaching our faces so that we'd be lighter and therefore in our consciousness more beautiful? Well, thank God, thank God for the teaching known as the science of mind that teaches that every event in our human experience is governed by law and order. And my friends, if this were otherwise, the universe would be a chaos and not a cosmos. And as it says in our Declaration of Principles, we really believe that the ultimate goal of all life will be a complete emancipation from all discord of every nature. And that this goal, this goal of human humanity is sure to be attained by all. Author W.I. Barth, in an article from Science of Mind magazine of February 1986, writes, and I quote, the universe of which our whole life is an essential part is penetrated through and through with logic and reason. So that in all its mighty fabric, not even the slenderest tissue or thread ever gets caught on the torn or torn on any jagged edge of chance. There are no, there are no mishaps, there's no, there, there is no chance, there's a carefully choreographed, choreographed designed, designed, and exquisitely, exquisitely beautiful, beautiful universe. You mean one in one, you know. know. Universe. universe. And we are, and we are all, all part of it. And, and so Bart so says, and I quote, our Earth, with its infinite variety of phenomena, is not formless chaos or the plaything of capricious forces, but is bound as if by golden chains into a unified whole by law. Here in the science of mind, we study the law and how to use it. The Nubian builders of the great pyramids were using laws of geometry and mathematics, which we still haven't even figured out completely. And yet we persist, the human race, in mistakenly limiting the laws of the universe to our present partial understanding, trying in vain to interpret every experience of life in the context of the laws we do know, and rejecting all else as somehow unscientific. No wonder, St. Paul said, for now we see through a glass darkly. We really haven't seen the full glory of the coming of the Lord, which is also can be interpreted as the coming of the law into fruition. But as religious scientists, we know that in addition to our known natural laws, there are spiritual laws which I believe, when they are more fully understood, will be found to be superbly natural rather than supernatural, because they do not contravene the integrity or the order of the universe. It is this deep understanding of and insight into the principles of these higher laws that enabled Jesus the Christ to perform the so-called miracles of his ministry. The master teacher clearly indicated to his followers the existence of laws which they could use and assured them that they could do the same. And even greater works will ye do if ye believe. People say that we do not worship Jesus, and they are right. Nowhere does he say that we should, we should do so. 
but we believe that his gospel was to all mankind and applicable to all times, ages, and cultures. And this is why we can affirm in our Declaration of Principles that we believe in the healing of the sick through the power of this mind. We believe in the control of conditions through the power of this mind. We believe, because Jesus said, if only you believe you can do what I am doing and even greater works. Edward Gibbon, the 18th century English historian who wrote the book, The History of, and, of the Decline and Fall of the Roman Empire, asserts that for 300 years, the followers of Jesus' teaching healed the sick and did other mighty works by their faith in the higher laws made known to them in their Gospels. But that as Christianity became more rich and worldly, the knowledge of these higher laws was lost. As we know, modern science and quantum physics are now proving the soundness of these early teachings, which were not just unique to Christianity. We didn't have a, have a, a hold on it. All religions, the scriptures of every religious faith, are luminous with examples of the workings of spiritual laws and principles, so that now, nowadays, once again, modern science is corroborating that which for untold ages faith has taught. And perhaps our Nubian ancestors knew these laws because those, those monuments that they, they have built that have endured so many thousands of years had to have been based on laws that we are just, we haven't even begun to, to figure out in their entirety. So the firm faith which we hold here at the Temple of Light Center for Spiritual Living is that an infinite intelligence, love, and personalness undergirds, pervades, and supports all that is. All life, and that includes each one of us, is a living demonstration and disclosure of the divinity that underlies the indwelling and divinity of all creatures and all creation. Nature's laws are God's laws, and like their creator, are infinite in depth and meaning. At the secondary school, which I, I mentioned earlier, we were made to learn little maxims or aphorisms which were called memory gems. How many people remember memory gems? We made to, little recitations that, that reminded us of the truths of life. You know, and I really bless my dad for teaching me that our ancestors were people who have been at the very pinnacle of human endeavor and evolution. And so, I wonder if they're still teaching memory gems. I'm not sure. But you know, the one that sticks with me and that I have, upon which I have based your assignment today, and you know, regulars at the Temple of Light Center for Spiritual Living know that I always give an assignment. Your assignment today is based on a memory gem that goes like this. Good, better, best. Never let it rest until your good is better and your better best. Good, better, best. Never let it rest until your good is better and your better best. And so your assignment, should you decide to undertake it, my friends, is to choose and airmark an area of your life that you really want to improve. It may already be good, but you want to make it better. Or you want to make it really the very best that you can be. I want you to choose an area, just one. You know, we, there are lots of things we want to improve, but I want you just for purposes of this assignment, just to choose one area that you want to excel in. And your assignment is to get hold of one of our practitioners or, or our ministers and ask them to work with you in this area. 
diligently for the, the remainder of Lent, right up to the Easter weekend, just to work with you at becoming and evolving spiritually and physically and emotionally and work-wise in every domain of your life and any domain that you have chosen to be not just good, but better, and in fact, to aim at being your best as you embrace your evolving spirituality. So let us affirm together, good, better, best, I will not let it rest until my good is better and my better best. Together, good, better, best, I will not let it rest until my good is better and my better best. Ernest Holmes, the founder of this great teaching, said, and I quote, a religious science church is a place where only two things happen. People are taught about a divine presence and a universal law of good, which reacts to it. And the people are taught how to use that law. And he says, that's all. We have nothing else to sell. And I want to say to the memory of Ernest Holmes, we think this is so powerful that we don't even want to sell it. We want to give it away. We think this teaching is the answer to all of the challenges and the problems that the world is facing. And we are about the business of making that which is already good because we have a good teaching and a good center in the Temple of Light Center for Spiritual Living and we are peopled by a community of good people. And we are working assiduously to make that good better until that better becomes the very best of human endeavor all across the globe. Holmes further says, and I quote, a religious scientist is humble before the greatness of things, but is not afraid of the greatness of things. For our future is a matter of, and listen to this, here is the future. One person comes to know what God is. That is, comes to know what God is through our teaching. Then two, then three, then a hundred. And then I want to continue and say then hundreds and thousands of people striving to be their very best in every domain and every area of human experience. My friends, our church is more than the building and the beautiful grounds. Our church is a state of consciousness. The consciousness of peace. The consciousness of abundance. The consciousness of love. The consciousness of service. All equaling the consciousness of unity, which is transforming not only Jamaica, but the entire world. And I've come this morning to tell you that each of you, right where you are in your own evolution and your own development, has an important role to play. The time has come to support that which we have been saying we believe by putting our love of truth and of our center into action, thereby raising the consciousness of all with whom we come into contact like our Nubian ancestors, we are building a lasting monument to human goodness and unity, which glorifies God. What we have to give the world is good. As a spiritual community of kindred change agents, we are working together to make it even better, and we will not rest until love of each other and of our fellow humans lifts us into the highest and best of our spiritual promise. The goal, my friends, is sure to be attained by all. And you know, our innovative teams coming out of our last year's summit are working assiduously to make all good better and our better best. And you are part of that movement. You are part of that, that exciting 
I want to call it thrust towards greatness, the greatness that is represented in the breathtaking beauty of the monuments built by our Nubian ancestors, the beauty of the fact that my father shared with me the first, the day just before I went into high school, the glory and the greatness of the heritage that is ours, that has been bequeathed to us. And we are, each of us, stewards and custodians of that great promise. And it's going to happen because we rely on one thing only. And that is God. God and God alone. I am indeed humble before the greatness of this mission, and I want to thank each of you for being a part of it. Namaste.